o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Wednesday, May 10th. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. The government health insurance program for people who are poor is about to get more expensive for New York counties. That means counties could have big decisions to make. Do they reduce services? Do they raise taxes? Um, do they uh, deplete reserves? Uh, those are all options that we're going to be faced with going forward. About 2,700 people have signed an online petition calling on SUNY Potsdam to change its mind about downsizing its theater and dance department. Also, we'll take a look at what's on the table for negotiations in Albany in the last few weeks of the legislative session. And Betsy Capus shares with us about the book that just won the Canadian Scotia Bank Gillis Prize. This novel appealed to me before I even read a page. We'll get a review of Sleeping Car by Suzette Mayer, plus much more. Coming up on Northern Light, stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by Mountain Orthotic and Prosthetic Services, a full-service practice committed to providing care for patients of all ages with offices in Lake Placid, Plattsburgh, and Malone. Details and referrals at mountainonp.com. And by St. Lawrence Health, whose affiliation with Rochester Regional Health means more patient access to specialty care. stlawrencehealthsystem.org. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. In the ongoing battle between New York State and county government's unfunded mandates, programs counties have to provide but don't get reimbursed for, caused the most friction. Now, the biggest unfunded mandate, Medicaid, is about to get even more expensive. Beginning this year, the state will start to withhold hundreds of millions of federal dollars it usually passes to counties to fund Medicaid, the health insurance program for low-income people. County leaders and North Country lawmakers in both parties say the move could mean higher local property taxes. The governor's office says the funds will be used to improve Medicaid. Kara Chapman reports. In New York State, counties have to chip in for Medicaid costs. For years, they've gotten federal funding that gets filtered through the state to help them do that. But that's about to change. Over the next few years, the state is going to reduce, then zero out the federal dollars it sends down to counties for Medicaid. State Senator Dan Steck puts it this way. The federal government's grandma and grandpa, and they decide to give the grandchildren money, that would be the counties, and the parents stepping in and taking that money out of their their grandkids' pockets. That's what the state is doing here. Steck represents the North Country's eastern portion. He says the counties in his district will have to pay anywhere from $1 to $3 million more per year in Medicaid costs. According to Spectrum News, the Nonpartisan Citizens Budget Commission estimates the change could raise property taxes by 7 to 14 percent. Clinton County Administrator Mike Zerlo, who's also president of the New York State Association of Counties, says county governments will have some big decisions to make. Do they reduce services? Do they raise taxes? Um, do they uh, deplete reserves? Uh, those are all options that we're going to be faced with going forward. Governor Kathy Hochul initially proposed keeping all the money that usually goes to counties for Medicaid starting this year. But both houses of the legislature rejected that and negotiated a three-year phase-out in the budget. When it's fully implemented in fiscal year 2026, it's estimated the state will keep about $774 million. In a statement, a spokesperson for the governor said the three-year off-ramp will help counties plan for future budgets. But Assemblyman Billy Jones says it's not enough time for the counties to adjust. They're not happy with it. I wasn't happy with it, but I will say bluntly that the governor could have done that in policy anyway. She could have just done it with a with a stroke of a pen or a phone call. The governor's spokesperson said the state has helped counties and New York City save almost thirty eight billion dollars in Medicaid costs since 2015. They said shifting the federal money will allow the state to fund investments, quote, to ensure access, promote equity and stabilize the health system serving New York's most vulnerable. 
The spokesperson said this year's budget includes more than $6 billion in major local aid programs for counties outside New York City. Even Zerlo says highway and public health funding were among the bright spots for counties in the budget. But he says this was not the year to go after the Medicaid funds. There was no urgent need to come after county governments this year. We have always been a partner. If, if we were ever in a crisis, I know that the Association of Counties would have worked with the administration and tried to figure out something to ameliorate the state's issue. This was not the year. For no reason they came after our money this year. Zerlo says counties plan to continue to lobby for the funding to be restored. But he says once you're used to a revenue stream, it's very difficult to let it go. Kara Chapman, North Country Public Radio, Plattsburgh. About 2,700 people have signed an online petition calling on SUNY Potsdam to change its mind about downsizing its theater and dance department. And CPR reported last week that five of the department's nine faculty members received notice their contracts would not be renewed or their status would be downgraded. The online petition by members, supporters, and alumni of the department say the faculty affected have demonstrated exceptional dedication and performance and are integral to the department's ongoing success and ask the university to reconsider. The university is facing a reported multi-million dollar deficit and declining student enrollment. SUNY Potsdam's president and SUNY's chancellor have both declined to comment on the changes. New York State is monitoring rising water levels on Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River, which are getting close to flood stage in some low-lying areas. David Summerstein reports. Even though there's been little rain in the North Country since last week, all the Great Lakes empty into Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence, and the whole region seen a lot of heavy spring rain. In a press release yesterday, Governor Kathy Hochul said Lake Ontario has risen above 247 feet. The lowest areas, mostly around Rochester, can flood around 248 feet. Hochul said the state is being proactive ready to deploy 25,000 sandbags as well as pumps and other equipment. But she said the current forecast doesn't call for the widespread flooding seen in 2017 and 2019. Since those floods, the state has invested up to $300 million to fortify shorelines from western New York to Ogdensburg, with 38 projects already complete or underway in Jefferson and St. Lawrence counties, including in Cape Vincent, Clayton, and Alexandria Bay. David Summerstein, North Country Public Radio. Listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's eight minutes past eight. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Just ahead, Betsy Capus drops by the show to review the award winning book, The Sleeping Car Porter. That's coming up in just a few minutes here on Northern Light. Gretchen Kohler on the fiddle, Daniel Kelly on the piano. Music by Gretchen Kohler and Daniel Kelly. And by the way, Gretchen is going to be the special guest host, along with Barb Heller on String Fever tomorrow afternoon. You can celebrate World Fiddle Day with Barb and Gretchen with a jam session Thursday afternoon starting at 3 o'clock. Practice up, join Barb and Gretchen Thursday afternoon at 3 for String Fever Fiddler's Jam. You can check out more at nocofiddlers.com. Northern Light is supported by Fort Dealer Presentation, helping to educate and recreate historical ventures of interest to the St. Lawrence region, fort1749.org. And by Blue Seed Studios, Saranac Lake, promoting community involvement in the arts on the web at blucseedstudios.org. 
There's one month to go until the 2023 New York State Legislative Session ends. A number of issues are still on the table to be negotiated. From Albany, Karen DeWitt has more. Some major items didn't make it into the state budget, which was passed over a month late on May 2nd. One is Governor Kathy Hochul's ambitious plan to build 800,000 housing units in the next decade to help ease the affordable housing crisis. It included a proposal to allow the state to override local zoning laws if local government leaders resisted plans to build new homes and apartments. The legislature objected to that, and the governor eventually dropped all of her housing proposals from the budget. Democrats who lead the Senate and Assembly also want any housing package to include more rights for tenants. The governor, speaking in late April after she announced a conceptual budget agreement, says she'll try again. We're going to take the time necessary to talk about other ways that we can make sure that we're building housing stock. I'm going to be looking at the suburbs. We're going to talk about our transit hubs and find a path forward because we're not surrendering on this issue. But Hochul says with so little time left in the session, any action to ease the housing crisis might have to wait until 2024. Let's sit down with the housing chairs and come up with a thoughtful approach, work on it throughout the next year as well, and look at it again next year's budget. The new budget does include changes to the state's bail reform laws, but some other criminal justice changes did not make it. A measure known as Clean Slate is gaining some momentum and key backing. It would expunge the records for some people convicted of crimes who've served their sentences, giving them a better chance to get a job. The state's business council supports it, and many companies, including National Grid, have recently come out in favor of it. And Assembly Speaker Carl Hastie said, Says it's a top priority. I think we will actually, we will definitely consider clean slate before the end of session. Survivors of sexual harassment, including former Fox News anchor Gretchen Carlson, are pressing for a bill that would outlaw non-disclosure agreements of all kinds. Carlson, who sued the former head of Fox News, Roger Ailes, for harassment and retaliation, signed a non-disclosure agreement as part of a settlement. As a result, she says she can't talk publicly about what's happened, even though it's been the subject of numerous news articles and even a Hollywood movie. Carlson has since co-founded the survivors advocacy group Lift Our Voices. This bill puts the power back in the hands of the survivors. If we've learned anything since the beginning of this movement six and a half years ago, it's that the only way to fix bad behavior at work is to be able to talk about it. We need to stop silencing people with forced arbitration and NDAs. Every worker deserves a voice. The push comes at a time when two members of the state assembly have been accused of harassment. It also comes as Governor Hochul fired a top political advisor, Adam Sullivan, over allegations that he fostered a toxic work environment and was demeaning to younger women on the governor's staff. Other measures being considered as the session winds down include aid in dying. That would give terminally ill people the right to use medication to end their lives at the time of their choosing. And bills to strengthen voting rights, including a requirement that ballot amendments be written in plain, easy-to-understand language. The legislature could stay past the final day of session, scheduled for June 8th, if they wanted more time to tackle these issues. But Speaker Hasty says that's unnecessary. I don't see the need to uh, extend session by any days at this point. Last year, the session also ended in early June to leave time for primary elections at the end of the month. But lawmakers reconvened in early July to strengthen the state's gun laws after a U.S. Supreme Court decision struck down the state's concealed carry statute. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. New York became the first state to ban gas stoves after Governor Kathy Hochul struck a budget deal with the state legislature. Buildings contribute 30 percent of New York's greenhouse gas emissions. Dr. Norman Edelman, a pulmonologist at Stony Brook Medicine, says decarbonizing buildings helps fight climate change and makes homes healthier and safer. There are several gases there, especially the gases that affect climate change. But the major gas that irritates the lungs are the the oxides of nitrogen. They cause inflammation in the airways. Gas hookups will be phased out of construction of new buildings in New York. Under seven stories by 2026, taller buildings must meet the regulation by 2029. 
Saratoga Arts held a press conference in Saratoga Springs yesterday to announce a grant that will shrink the funding gap needed for the Arts Center's extensive renovations and upgrades. Saratoga Arts was awarded a grant uh, awarded a grant totaling $766,000 from the New York State Council on the Arts to help support the center's $2 million revitalization project. Louise Kerr, Saratoga Arts Executive Director, agrees with Governor Kathy Hochul, who says Strengthening the creative sector increases tourism, boosts the economy, and enhances a region's heritage and cultural life. The arts, they touch so much of our lives that we don't even think about, right? So Saratoga Springs, people think health, history, and horses. And a dear colleague of mine, Sarah Craig from Cafe Lena, she said, you know, what they don't know is the health actually really means arts. <laughs> That's what contributes to the health of a community. You know, it, if you think about if there was no music, no photography, no painting, no dance, no concert to go to, or book festival, or markets in the park, no beautiful objects made by artists, it would be pretty dismal. <laughs> These things are really, it's what makes Saratoga such a wonderful place to live or any place wonderful to live. The Saratoga Arts Grant is part of a record capital project funding uh, funding announcement by the State Arts Council, which totals over $2 million to 144 capital projects across the state. Eleven projects in the North Country will receive grants, including Historical Saranac Lake, the Adirondack Historical Association, Fort Ticonderoga, the Old Forge Library, and the North Country Children's Museum in Potsdam. <laughs> Listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. In just a minute, we'll check in with book reviewer Betsy Capis, then stick around after the show for Bird Note coming up at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Nice day today, tomorrow, sunshine, highs this afternoon around 70. The Weather Service predicts highs in the 70s tomorrow with light winds out of the south southwest. Then uh, Friday, a mix of sun and clouds, but continued mild highs, low to mid-70s. And for the weekend at this point, sunshine Saturday, highs upper 60s. Sunday, partly cloudy skies, highs in the low to mid-60s. A little cooler on Sunday with highs, low 60s, and light winds out of the northeast. But today, sunny, a high around 70, light winds out of the south-southwest. Right now, it's sunshine. There's sunshine and 49 degrees here in Canton. Well, every year, one novel by a Canadian author wins the Scotiabank Giller Prize, an honor that includes a $100,000 gift. Our book reviewer, Betsy Capis, read this year's winner, The Sleeping Car Porter by Suzette Mayer. Todd, have you ever ridden on a long-distance train? Uh, in Europe, but, but not here in North America. Well, I've ridden Amtrak across the country a few times, and years ago I took the Canadian train to Vancouver. So this novel appealed to me before I even read a page. In Mayer's book, the year is 1929, and the protagonist, R.T. Baxter, feels lucky to have his job as a sleeping car porter. He's saving up money so he can go to dental school. Dental school. I know, but that's what he wants to do. Uh, Baxter's a young black man who came to Canada from an unnamed Caribbean island because he wanted to become a dentist. Mayer has fun writing about how Baxter observes his passengers' mouths. Here's Baxter. He signs out at the office in the station, and the sign-out man tells him his train and car and then hands him his slip. The fellow has an upper lateral incisor that's turned dark gray. That tooth needs extracting. I love that passage. So this is a humorous novel. Well, in many ways, yes. Um, The passengers do ridiculous things that really made me laugh. But Baxter's in constant fear of getting demerits for his work. If he gets too many, he'll be fired. He also has a secret. Baxter's a gay man in a time when he could end up in jail because of being so. 
He's been propositioned by white male passengers, and he's terrified that someone has seen this and will report him. Uh Uh-huh. Now the novel sounds more like a tragedy. Comedy, tragedy, and it's a bit of a thriller. Most of the book is set during one very long train ride from Montreal to Vancouver. In the Rockies, the train is stopped because of a landslide across the tracks. Baxter's already sleep-deprived, and the landslide means he has to take care of his passengers day and night for two extra days. Here's Mayor. Sleepiness drips off Baxter, pools around his feet, forms quicksand that tangles up his feet every now and then, makes him see spots where there are none. So I'm curious, who does Baxter have as passengers in in his sleeping car? Ah, yes, the characters in his car are, of course, all white and Mm. all privileged. Mm. Uh, They expect Baxter to do everything for them, and most of them give him no thanks. A woman Baxter calls Granny is traveling with her young granddaughter Esme, whose mother has recently died. Esme won't go to sleep, and since Baxter can't go to sleep, he offers to care for her while her granny takes a nap. Here's Mare. Granny crawls into her berth and yanks the curtain closed behind her. She gusts out a snore before Esme and Baxter even reach the end of the aisle. Esme sits on the floor of the smoker, planted in the puddle of her nightgown, as he shines shoes and whispers the names of Saturn's moons. He gives her a clean cloth and lets her brush and polish her ceramic horse, the brush gigantic and clumsy in her hands. Hmm. How long does Baxter look after Esme? For the rest of the book. Esme won't leave him and she won't sleep. So we have this, she won't sleep, he can't sleep. Baxter's incredibly kind to her, letting her help him with all of his work. Okay, so I'm just wondering... Does Baxter ever get to go to dentistry school? Or does he get more demerits and get fired from his uh, job? I guess that's that's the thriller part of the book, right? It is, but there is so much going on in this short book. Baxter's a fascinating character, and readers learn his hopes and fears, plus there are all these little stories about the passengers. And the prose is rich and playful. Sounds like you're saying it. the book... Deserves to win a prize. I'm glad it won. (laughs) It's delightful and thoughtful. Mm. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on The Sleeping Car Porter, Betsy. My pleasure, Todd. Our book reviewer, Betsy Capis, lives, reads, and writes in Colton. You're listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio 8822. I'm Monica Sandreski here with Todd Moe. We are so glad you could join us. For a number of years, the Saranac Lake-based folk group The Rustic Riders have held a Pete Seeger tribute night. The pandemic put the kibosh on it for a bit, but now they are back with their seventh Pete Seeger tribute, the Earth Care Coffee House. And if you know Northern Light, you know we're Pete Seeger fans around here, so he couldn't resist. The night is coming up Saturday night at 7 at the First Presbyterian Church of Saranac Lake. And to get us in the mood for that coffee house, here is Pete Seeger's song, E-R-I-E Canal. We were 40 miles from Albany. Forget it, I never shall. What a terrible storm we had one night on the E-R-I-E Canal. Oh, the E-R-I-E was rising and the gin was getting low. I scarcely think we'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo. Till we get to Buffalo. We were loaded down with barley. We were chock full up on rye. The captain, he looked down on me with his gall darn wicked eye. Oh, the E-R-I-E was rising and the gin was getting low. And I scarcely think we'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo. Till we get to Buffalo. Two days out from Syracuse, the vessel struck a shoal. We like to all been foundered on a chunk of Lackawanna coal. Oh, the E-R-I-E was rising and the gin was getting low. I scarcely think we'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo, till we get to Buffalo. We hollered to the captain on the towpath treading dirt. He jumped on board and stopped the leak with his old red flannel shirt. Oh, the E-R-I-E was rising and the gin was getting low. I scarcely think we'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo, till we get to Buffalo. The cook, she was a grand old gal. She wore a ragged dress. 
We hoisted her upon the pole as a signal of distress. Oh, the e he was rising, the gin was getting low. I scarcely think we'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo, till we get to Buffalo. The winds begin to whistle, the waves begin to roll. We had to reef our royals on that raging canal. Oh, the e he was rising, the gin was getting low. I scarcely think we'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo, till we get to Buffalo. Well, when we got to Syracuse, off mule he was dead. The nine mule he got blind staggers, we cracked him on the head. Oh, the e ri -E was rising, the gin was getting low. I scarcely think we'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo, till we get to Buffalo. The captain, he got married, the cook, she went to jail. And I'm the only sea cook son that's left to tell the tale. Oh! He was rising, the gin was getting low. I scarcely think we'll get a drink till we get to Buffalo. Till we get to Buffalo. Erie Canal by Pete Seeger. Again, that is to get us in the mood ahead of the Pete Seeger tribute, the Earth Care Coffee House, coming up with the Saranac Lake based folk group, the Rustic Riders. That's Saturday night at 7 o'clock at the First Presbyterian Church of Saranac Lake. It's coming up on 27 minutes past 8. This is Northern Light. And uh, coming up tonight, there is a storytelling swap hosted by well-known storyteller Deborah Dunleavy at, uh, in Brockville at the Arts Hub Lower Level, 7 to 9 tonight, a storytelling swap night. Bring a story or just bring your ears to listen. Uh, a number of great storytellers in the Brockville, Ontario area tonight starting at 7. And the Howell Story Slam will be live in Newcomb, Monica. And you're invited. The theme is school days. Yes, it's always <laughs> a good time. Now Friday the- night. Friday night. Now, these are live five-minute stories, unscripted, unscripted, no props allowed. No but notes. No notes, but everyone is welcome to come, welcome to tell a story. You just got to sign up when you get there. I think they take the first 15 people to sign up. You can find out more, of course, at our website, ncpr.org slash Howell. Again, that is the Howell Story Slam coming up in Newcomb. And don't forget about um, the online artist talk coming up tomorrow night at the Lake George Arts Project. This is for um, a conversation with abstract painter Martin Weinstein. He's based in the Hudson Valley, and he does something pretty interesting with his paintings. They're sort of dreamlike. Um, what he does is uh, layers these interlocking sheets of um, clear acrylic panels, and it adds, it makes for a very interesting element. You can see more at lakegeorgearts.org, and while you're there, you can sign up for um, an online conversation with Martin Weinstein tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock through the Lake George Arts Project. And there's music uh, Friday night at St. Bernard's Church in Saranac Lake. The Northern Lights Choir, directed by Helen DeMung, will be presenting their spring concert Friday night. The 60-piece uh, uh, vocal ensemble will present music, uh, um, Americana songs, uh, and different, many different uh, beautiful choral pieces sung across many different genres. Tickets are available at the door uh, by donation, $10. That's uh, Northern Lights Choir, Friday night, this Friday night, May 12th, 730 at St. Bernard's Church in Saranac Lake. And don't forget to check out the Barn Quilt Show, currently on display at the Frederick Remington Art Museum in Ogdensburg. It'll be on view at the museum's Hershey Gallery uh, through Sunday, May 21st, featuring over 40 locally made barn quilts. That's 40 local artisanal artists that have that have put these together, fiber artists that have made these, and many of them will be available for purchase um, after the show. You can find out more at frederickremington.org.
That music means it is the end of the show for the day. Morning Edition continues in just a minute. And we'll get welcome back into the show with a story from, you know him, Brian Mann. A dedicated bunch of techies in Seattle are trying to preserve what's left of America's original social network, the landline phone system. He's got the story for us coming up in just a couple of minutes. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Mo. Thanks for listening. Be well.